Welcome to Dialogue Out Loud Interviews. My name is Margaret Olson Hemming, and I'm the art editor at Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought. Today, I'm here with one of the artists whose art can be found in the spring 2024 issue of the journal. Charlotte Condy focuses on life and love against the backdrop of Latter-day Saint community, culture, its triumphs, and its challenges. She says that her personal wrestle with the divine and life with scrupulosity informs her spiritual lens and creative expression. Her art explores the divine, the personal, the community, and the interplay and communion of all three. Finding God in the intimate and the communal is her spiritual and creative practice. Charlotte, welcome to um, Dialogue Out Loud. Thanks, Margaret. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'd like to begin with hearing a little bit about your background. Could you tell us when did you first begin creating art and what were some challenges you faced in that path of becoming an artist and uh, choosing to pursue artistic study and and becoming a professional artist? Mm. Um, I have been creative my whole life. Uh, Being creative was my first language. Um, my father was, he graduated in studio arts. Um, and so he was like kind of that first, um, touch point for me for having access to, you know, learning how to use color and shape and light. Um, and he really encouraged that. Um, but I didn't study art in school i studied asian studies that was my degree that i finished and i really enjoy people and i enjoy learning about other people and their culture and language and all of these things that make us human and while i've always been creative and have created my whole life i wasn't probably until uh, maybe 2016 2017 i started selling and then I was doing um, lino printing, relief printing types of things. Um, and actually, I, I I moved away from it because the lino printing was damaging a nerve in my arm. <laughs> and so I, um, I changed medium a few times. I came to using old books and reusing them actually out of a call for art made out of it was the um the miracle forgiveness by latter-day stories uh podcast that they had made a call for art they do a show every year art created out of the book pages and that was the first time i had worked with book pages um and while i wasn't super satisfied with that first piece um, it was a great jumping off point when I was asked to help um, not just create art for, but um, I curated a show about scrupulosity. Um, it was at the end of 2022. And that was a show that incorporated I think it was at least 30 different artists who either lived with scrupulosity or a family member did so we had those voices speaking from that experience um and so that was that was kind of the beginning of this new medium for me I think challenges that I have faced um I think for any woman (laughs) is especially for a woman that might be married and have children that's that's a tremendous hurdle and while it it's a joy um finding time um to do that is really hard um children don't understand that um impulse to create for the adult even though that's like their language and i feel like when i'm with my children and they are creating like that's that's such a human innate desire Mm -hmm. and as long as we continue to nurture that we'll never lose it as adults um and so luckily you know as my 
my children have gotten older, they they absolutely understand, you know, mom needs some time <laughs> to go and do that. Um, but, and also, while I think there's a lot of um, inroads being made for women, especially in this um, Mormon community, as it spans across the different different families in Mormonism, we um, we have a lot of women represented in this art community, but it's still um, kind of an uphill battle um, being able to access female voices. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, those have been some of the challenges in, in the journey. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for talking about that. Do you think it's interesting... Um, with the Mormon art community, how many women participate and how few get resources and and attention, right? So Yeah, for sure. And I know that there are grants and and um scholarships, especially for mothers, um, which I think is awesome and definitely there should be more of that. But yeah, within our community, because women are strongly encouraged to stay at home with children, um, but there's also that that call to be engaged in our community. We're trying to do both, and um, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to see and to compare when I when I look at all these women that I know personally who are in this community, and then other women outside how they manage to do it. Um, and uh, sometimes it feels like a wing and a prayer for warming women. <laughs> yes. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about your art. So, um, sure. and it's, you know, it's unusual for, um, for a Mormon artist. It's unusual for anything we've, we've printed in dialogue before. Um, so it's multimedia art. Can you, I mean, we'll show some images uh, for people watching but online, but could you just talk a little bit about um, the materials that you use for your work? Absolutely. So when I am doing pieces, specifically Mormon-themed type of pieces or spiritual pieces, I tend to gravitate towards older, either out of print or or just older texts that come from Latter-day Saint tradition. And a lot of them are donated to me by people who have suffered real spiritual abuse and harm, and they are leaving the church or expanding their spiritual experience and perspective. And they have all these books. Like we we collect a lot of these books in our lives and and they no longer serve them. And, and I always put a call out now and then for anybody who has anything they want to get rid of and will take off your hands they will mail it to me and so i've used things like mormon doctrine miracle forgiveness millennial messiah um a lot of things that i had never heard of a lot of old stuff um and a lot of things that definitely are out of print and should be for lots of good reasons um and i i like using these things because one they're a great representation of our heritage um but because they're often things that have caused harm i like to take them literally deconstruct this book and i will dye the pages i will use dye and then i dry them on racks and then i begin cutting them into pieces um sometimes random, sometimes specifically design shapes um, to create images. Um, The the process is cathartic for me, but it also means a lot to the people who donate the books. And if I can remember, and sometimes I'll write down who gave what to me, I'll, I'll shout out to them, hey, you helped make this. And it it means a lot to them to see that part of their pain has turned into something that's really beautiful. Um, and it, it it speaks to trying to create a new version of yourself or a new direction in your life mm-hmm. out of the things that have made up your past that you can't extract. 
but maybe finding a new use for. And um, I think that's a real healing thing. Yeah. I love that. I didn't know that you were collecting materials from other people. And I love that you have found that way to bring art and community together. That's really Yeah. It's, really it's fun. fun. So I'd like to talk about Four Sisters specifically. Sure. Um, I think this is such an interesting piece and unusual in, in many ways. You have four you know, what looks like four female bodies, you seem to be, you know, using these female bodies in ways that are a little different than typical Mormon art. Um, I think it's very interesting that they, you know, have this physical connection to one another, that they have these sort of shared halos. Mm -hmm. And also you put them against um, sheet music. Yeah. I would love to hear your thoughts about all of those things. Sure. So Four Sisters was actually the first image I had um, kind of come up with out of this whole series of, it was a Mother's Day series. It was a series of different kinds of mothers in our lives or mothering people in our lives. And Four Sisters directly comes from my experience with my three sisters. I have three younger sisters and we share a lot of childhood trauma. We, you know, we have a really close bond and I I like to work in colors that are not skin toned uh -huh. intentionally, mostly because I want people to focus on the feeling rather than creating something that I'm not trying to tell people what to think or feel with my pieces. I want them to decide what they're feeling. And so I choose to um, embody people in unusual ways, whether it be unusual colors, like not flesh colors. Um, and sometimes I don't give them hair. And I'll often give everybody halos mostly because i want everyone to recognize that there is divine in all of us and we all have the capacity to find that in each other and ourselves um and so these four sisters the way that they interlock and they 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 share a lot they they sustain each other they uphold each other um and there's just a shared love there um, that just reminded me so much of my sisters. The sheet music, um, it it wasn't particularly intentional. However, music was the backdrop for our childhood. We all are musical. We all learned instruments. Um, and it is also like a a way that we relate to each other. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So I would love to hear, particularly with this piece, but also just your your greater work in general, um, how do you see it engaging with, with larger issues in Mormon art or Mormon studies or, or Mormon culture? I know you're really involved with the conversations that are sort of ongoing with Mormon art and she would have a lot of connections to um, other Mormon artists. So yeah, I would love to hear how you feel like, you know, you see your work both as a curator and as an um, being part of those conversations. <clears throat> I mean, I love seeing our community create in new and interesting ways and telling our stories Um in unique voices. And I especially love all the work that Esther Kandari does to help bring in those diverse voices, diverse representations of Christ, of the membership of the body of Christ within our community. I think that is extremely valuable and I applaud and support everything that she's doing. Um, <clears throat> I think what I am bringing is a little different from everyone because I am not trying to tell a story so much as 
I'm trying to reflect feelings. I'm trying to also um, give images to consider or think about. Like right now, I'm just beginning a new series on women in authoritative spaces and roles, which is no one has done that before. Um, Challenging our current situation now um, giving us something to look at and and aspire to or hope for as as you know things are changing always within our community um and i love that that phrase you know you don't see it until you dream it or you don't dream it until you see it and mm-hmm. and you have to be able to see it to start imagining it and so the role of the artist in the community is really important because it holds the artist holds up a mirror um and the artist also you know can point to things that are valuable for us as a community um so we we're storytellers but we're also truth tellers Mm -hmm. um and and so mine there there is tiny little corner for some of us who are I guess would be abstract artists where we don't tell you a story and it's a little harder. It's not the type of stuff that's going to be hung in a meeting house, but it is definitely stuff that I would hope starts conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It reminds me of um, what you're saying reminds me of the windows and mirrors theory. Have you ever heard Mm -hmm. about it? Remind me. So like, um, I first heard about it from children's book librarians where they say children need windows and mirrors for the books that they read. So they need books that reflect their own experience and they need windows that will help them see into other people's experience. I like that. Yeah. And um, I think we need both kind of art. Yeah. Right? You need, I mean, in every facet of our culture, but you need some art that is sort of reflecting back what is happening. And then you need some that gives people a new vision of something different. Uh Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, tell me, tell me how you see your work reflecting philosophies or aspects of your identity. And I think you've touched on this a little bit um, with you know, what you kind of imagine with church stuff, but you know, even outside of Mormonism, like t- just tell me a little bit more about how your, how does your identity, how is it reflected in your work? Yeah. And I think that's also hard because I want to talk about things I've done recently that you don't have images of, <laughs> but um so because I identify as pansexual, um, that's a really uh, wide, um, all-encompassing type of emotional identity. And for me, I, I, it's a personal practice to find God in everyone that I see. It helps me love everyone. And I mean, that's a Christian practice, but it's also me really tapping into the way that I connect with other people. And so that's why I try to be real careful about not giving my people too much detail because I want them, I want the viewer to be able to look at my pieces and say, this feels like something I understand or this, this feels uh, like home to me. So I recently did a piece for the Heavenly Parents show that MacArthur Krishna, Krishna had um, created at Written Vision. And it was about this idea of Heavenly Parents. And I'm a more expansive perspective type of person. And I, I don't really like that idea of uh, eternal gender or embodiment. Um, and so I, I dug from different symbolisms from different traditions. We had, I had two bodies that 
were intertwining around a tree. And that came from a lot of different places. And they weren't gendered. Um, they were blue. They shared halos. But these are these are all reflective of my expansive, not just my sexuality, but the way I see humanity that um, there are things that we all share and that we can all connect on. And I like to be the type of person where I try and find that common ground always, um, whether it's in my creative work or when it's in a, you know, in communication or relationship, I'm trying to find the thing that we agree on to build on. Um, And it's interesting how with that piece, so many people had contacted me that it resonated with, and and not just members of the church, but members who were out of the church, Hindus, people who practice witchcraft, people who are atheists, they've all contacted me and said, I need a copy of this, I need a print of this, because it really speaks to my soul. And that told me that I was tapping into something uh, beautiful and that I, I was on the right path because that was my intention. Um, and I have another piece about to show at the Certain Women show at the G. Kirk Richards Gallery um, this next month. And the theme for the show was um, Measure of Her Creation. And that's a very specific phrase within our warming community that we understand from the temple. And for me, it always had meant like, what was the point of your existence? What were you created for? And 20 years, that meant something very specific, primarily procreation. Mm-hmm. But after living a life of infertility with PCOS, you know, adopting children, finally getting pregnant just be- before I turned 40, um, and then also losing a pregnancy after that pregnancy, um, experiencing that wide spectrum of what that means to procreate, to have children. Um, I knew that what that means to uh, fulfill the measure of my creation wasn't just that, and it was well beyond that. And And so I had to be really reflective of you know, what, why am I here? What is it that I'm doing? And it did come back to my art. And for me, it is always about creating and sustaining community. And, and the image I had created were a group of people hugging each other. And it's a large halo around all of them, one large one. And around them, it's actually script from 1958 Relief Society magazines. And I actually cut out some of the ads with some of the images of folding chairs and folding tables and and words that are so unique to our community. And in no mocking way, but to recognize that this is also our culture and it's kind of impossible to pull it from who we are, but we can still use all of these building blocks to continue to build on it and create something really beautiful that does serve all of us now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's just wonderful. I love how you're pulling all of these pieces together um, with, you know, yourself and your community and, um, you know, different aspects of your own identity. Um. You've already told us a little bit of projects you're involved in. Uh, can you can you share with us where people can find more of your work and, and oh. what you're doing? Sure. So my my Instagram page is the most active and best. It's it's the um, Charlotte Condi Art handle, and my website is the same charlottecondiart.com. Um, you can buy prints on the website um but i regularly do stuff on instagram i i love i kind of consider myself a mid-century history curator i also talk a lot about mid-century but i love to get into mid-century church because that's something that we don't know a lot about Mm -hmm. Um, we know a lot about pioneer history 
but that time kind of between when Relief Society was reorganized and then between correlation, like, I love that meaty part right there that we don't have a lot of information on. And I love to get old magazines and um, even the old general conference reports are just fun to pull apart because they still reported numbers in the financial statements. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, you're a great Instagram follow. Follow. Oh, so thanks. <laughs> really encourage listeners to um to check out what you're posting. Um, thank you so much for being here. This is just wonderful to hear background about your work and and to understand what you're doing a little bit better. Oh, thank you, Margaret. This is so great. In this spring 2024 issue, you can find more of Charlotte Condy's artwork, as well as a cover by Rachel Thomander uh, called Maria de Los Angeles, and some great articles, including an interview by James Jones of Cornell West and a roundtable uh, considering the question of should the LDS Church apologize for the temple and priesthood ban. So I encourage you to go uh, look up and read the entire issue. Uh, it's, I've been enjoying it the last week. It's it's a really excellent one, and um, and the art is just fabulous. Hmm, is it that late? Dad will be here any minute. Better tell Mother she's needed in the kitchen. Ah, yes, the classic nuclear family. Dad, mom, two kids, a white picket fence, and everybody knows their role. I grew up believing this was the one right way to be a family, and I believed that until I started getting to know real people who didn't fit that mold. We're watching this old nuclear family model explode in real time, but we don't need to hit the panic button. We can let curiosity lead the way. I'm Blair Hodges, host of Family Proclamations. I'm on a quest to find out everything I can about family, gender identity, and sexuality, and I want you to join me. On this podcast, I'm talking to best-selling authors about marriage, divorce, cohabitation, single adulthood, parenting, childlessness, adoption, fostering, gender identity, human biology, and lots more. We'll learn about different families and identities, past, present, and future. So please get ready to surrender old stereotypes and embrace new perspectives. There's no single way to be a family, and every kind of family has something we can learn from. Check out Family Proclamations anywhere you get your podcasts and at familyproclamations.org. Presented by Fireside with Blair Hodges. Ah, dinner time. This is the time for pleasant discussion in a thoroughly relaxed mood. Dialogue Podcast Network.